Hello, everyone, and welcome to our last read aloud of the summer. It's a little bit sad, but this is one of my favorite weeks. It's our not quite Disney fairy tale week. So these are books that are either rewritten fairy tales or sort of alternative fairy tales. So that means that it's not what you might expect or it has a modern twist on it. So today I am going to be reading part of Wendy Mass's Twice Upon a Time series. I will be reading Beauty and the Beast, the only one who didn't run away. And I took off the dust jacket so it would be a little bit easier for me to read. So this is a rewrite of Beauty and the Beast, which you probably have heard of, whether you've read a book version of it or you've seen one of the many movies. It is one of my favorite stories and this was a really cool take on it. So here is chapter one and it has different points of view. So this is in the point of view of beauty. Today started poorly and got even worse. It is now nightfall and I am certain even the village's dung heap cleaner would not want to change places with me. I should have known the winds of good tidings were not blowing my way the moment I laid eye on the baker's new apprentice, a boy a few years my senior who I've never seen in the village before. Our kitchen maid usually does the errands, but she is visiting her family today. So I went to fetch her order of barley rolls. I do not often venture out into town alone for Papa worries and his worrying makes me nervous. But this morning I made sure to hold my head high and to look more confident than I felt. I ignored anyone who called out for me to buy whatever they were selling and made sure to step carefully over the waste constantly being tossed out the windows to the street below. Part of me wanted to take off running in the fields behind the village church and forget the barley rolls. I never feel nervous when I run, but that would be unladylike. I have not been allowed to run freely for years now. When I arrived at the bakery, the baker, a kind man who always smells like fresh bread, greeted me by name. One of the three things happened when someone's, pardon, one of three things happens when someone hears my name for the first time. The worst is when they laugh. The second worst is when they start to laugh but quickly turn it into a cough so as not to appear rude. Lastly, if they are a halfway decent sort, they will squint at my face as though searching for some prettiness that perhaps they missed initially. Upon finding none, they will then say something like, have you seen the new juggler performing in town square? Such talent. No one in all my 12 and three quarter years has ever said that the name beauty suits me. I blame my mother, may her soul rest in peace in peaceful slumber amidst fields of wildflowers. She used her very last breath to bestow my name upon me. If I were the betting type, I would say she was more likely referring to the beauty shining forth from the gates of heaven which were no doubt opening wide and welcome, then to the infant held up before her, red-faced and sporting a nose that leaned a bit too far to the left. My nose, thankfully, has righted itself as I have grown, mostly. When the baker said my name, his new apprentice turned to look. I figured he would choose the first option and laugh. He had the type of sharp chin and thin lips that indicate a certain meanness of spirit, but he did not laugh. Rather, he surprised me with this response I had not heard before. He tipped an imaginary hat at me and said, good day, beauty, my name is Handsome. And then he laughed. The baker gave him a sharp jab in the ribs and waved off my coin as he handed me my sack of rolls. I cannot tell if my face flushed from the heat of the bakery's huge oven or the hurtful words, likely both. I know the teasing should not bother me for I have many good qualities. My sister, Clarissa, insists no one makes better ginger candies, and I can outrun a hare, not that there is much use for this skill unless one is chasing hares, which I am not allowed to do anymore after chasing away the Easter hare three years ago. Plus, no one in our village reads as well as I, including the monks at the monastery, and they read all day long. But the teasing bothers me nonetheless. I wish my name had gone to Clarissa, nearly three years my senior, who is truly beautiful. You know the type, hair soft as the finest silk from across the sea, round blue eyes like robin's eggs, and a forehead so high she had been mistaken for royalty. She is also sweet and gentle and does not furrow her brow by thinking of serious things. 
All of the boys in town want her hand in marriage, but she turns them down. Though she cares deeply about maintaining or bettering her social standing as the daughter of a successful merchant, Clarissa is holding out for love. Where she is romantic, I am a realist. Romantic love is something found only in the books Papa sells to the lords and ladies of the kingdom for a tidy profit. I should know, for I have read many of them. My head is full of stories from the books Papa buys and sells without ever opening the cover himself. Clarissa's head is full of purple silk gowns and dances and handsome troubadours playing a lute. One day soon, Papa shall tire of Clarissa's silliness and will marry her off to whomever he deems her best match. Although the thought of marriage currently makes me shudder, neither my sister nor I shall marry for love. It is simply not the way of things. Clarissa insists I should not look at life so bleakly, for it makes me seem unpleasant and no one will want to be in my company. She says that if I took the time to comb my hair and powder my cheeks and stop wearing Papa's old tunics and breeches, people might actually smile when they hear my name. She may be right, but I do not intend to find out. Much to my surprise, being insulted by the apprentice turned out to be the high point of my day. For some time between this afternoon when my sister lit the hearth to stave off the first autumn chill and sunset when I returned home from my errands, our house burned to the ground. And that's the end of chapter one. Chapter two is in the perspective of beast. Darkness, cold, silence, but for the fearful panting in my ear. The breath warming my ear is not mine. My own mouth is closed tight against the cold air and the tiny winged bugs that surround us. My vision is clear though, impeded only by the thickness of the forest. Jump, the voice screams. So I spring up, easily clearing the top of the ditch. We run deeper into the forest, thick trees ominous and unyielding. The ground hard and unforgiving on my bare feet. I do not know why my feet are bare. My mother, the queen, would never allow me to step foot outside the castle without boots on, even when the sun is high and hot in the sky. Yet I clearly feel the dirt and rocks and twigs beneath me. Duck, the voice yells. I try to twist my head to see in whom the voice belongs, but it is dark, so dark. Duck! I have waited too long to obey. The top of my head crashes into the branch above, but it does not hurt. It never hurts. But after the crash, the voice shouting in my ear is silenced. It is at this point I always wake up, my night clothes stuck to me with sweat. My first thought is always to look around for the person who shouted to me in the dream, but I'm always alone. I've had this dream every week since I turned 13 a few months back, but this is the first time I have had it while out of my bed. I hear my brothers calling my name, but do not reply to Alexander's shouts. I shake off the cobwebs of the dream, surprised that I actually fell asleep while hiding atop the castle's tallest tower. I turn my attention to the stars above. In my dream, I cannot see them. My tutor, Master Cedric, says there is a star in the heavens for every person who walks the ground below. Mother says my tutor has peculiar ideas. I think that's why I like him, for I too have been called odd. If I were a normal prince, I would be inside with the rest of the royal family, escorting our remaining guests across the dance floor. Instead, I'm sitting with my back against the hard stone wall, trying to pretend my nightmare does not bother me. All I wanted to do tonight was to play my bagpipes and admire the bright stars of the summer triangle, which shall soon be disappearing from view as the summer turns to fall. Was that so much to ask? The door to the balcony creaks open behind me, I know without turning that it is Alexander, the heir to our father's throne, and a much better prince than I. A much better everything, actually, but I don't mind. If only one of us should have the ability to speak five languages, it should be the one who will one day have a kingdom to rule. If only one is able to discuss the great works of philosophy and mathematics with the finest minds in the land, which also, while also being charming, witty, handsome, and an excellent rider of horses, it should be Alexander. And tall, did I mention tall? At 14, he is easily a head and a half taller, though I am only a year his junior. Riley, 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 he says, sitting down next to me and pulling his knees to his chest. I have given you as long as I could. I even pretended to check the dungeons and you know how I feel about them. You must return to the party immediately. Mother is beginning to turn various shades of purple. Must I truly? I have already stepped on the toes of two princesses, a duchess and a lady-in-waiting, who I am pretty sure snuck into the castle when the royal guard's backs were turned. 
Alexander leans over and straightens the silver chain that links the tips of my velvet cape. There are worse things in the world than dancing with beautiful girls, little brother. You make it sound more unpleasant than cleaning the dung heaps. Now come, duty calls. I do not know why everyone always assumes the worst job is cleaning the latrines. It is smelly without a doubt, but sometimes amidst the waste, a pearl will turn up, lost from some woman's necklace, or coins from a nobleman's pocket, or so I am told since mother keeps me far from the laborers. I blow one last forlorn note on my bagpipes and follow Alexander back into the small room inside the tower. I rest the bagpipes against the wall before heading down the winding staircase. If I brought them with me, mother would no doubt make me play them for the gathered guests. Being the center of attention gives me hives, and I do not want to end this already disagreeable evening with a visit from the castle doctor. The man is all too attached to his leeches. And that is the end of chapter two, and I will end my reading of this book there for now. But in the meantime, I will give you some recommendations of some awesome, not quite Disney, fairy tale or alternative fairy tale books. So first we have a book by Gail Carson Levine. This is A Tale of Two Castles. And Gail Carson Levine writes Ella Enchanted, which you may have seen the movie for. It's an awesome movie and an awesome book. And she writes amazing stories. We have The Royal Woods, which seems to be a modern take on some kind of fairy tale. And it's probably a cool alternative fairy tale. We have A Grain the Brave by Cornelia Funk, who also wrote Inkheart, which you may have seen in one of my earlier videos. And she writes really interesting fantasy books. We also have The Kingdom Keepers, which I might have mentioned in one of my earlier read alouds. I don't quite remember. But The Kingdom Keepers is really interesting because it is definitely a not quite Disney fairy tale. It takes place in the Disney parks after dark, and it's when all of the evil parts of Disney come alive. Next, we have Unlocking the Spell, which is another take on different fairy tales that might not be entirely what you are familiar with, but it seems pretty cool. And I love the illustration style. It's a little bit similar to what you might see in Tangled by Disney. We have the Quantum League Spell Robbers, which is a really cool fantasy book and they use their imagination to save the world. And lastly, we have The Never Girls, The Space Between, and this obviously takes place in the world of Peter Pan. And I have always loved The Fairies of Pixie Hollow, so I want to read this story and I will hopefully um, be able to put it back soon enough for you all to pick it up. And we also have the Storybook of Legends Ever After High, which is a TV series, but they also have the books and they are another take on some awesome fairy tales, including Grimm's fairy tales and more. So that is all we have for today. I hope that you have had an awesome summer of programming and it's sad to see us all go, but you can go ahead and rewatch all of these videos and more later in the summer and during the school year. So I hope that you've all enjoyed the programming and that you all come and pick up some stories from the library. That's all for now. See you soon.